panoramas. Today, I'm gonna share the way that some new technology has really simplified my thinking and my capture techniques for getting really ultra wide or high resolution images using panoramic capture techniques. Uh, and I'll also share some new uh, no parallax measurements for the new bodies and lenses that I've been shooting with. Hey everybody, welcome to this week's video. Uh, I'm gonna run through and answer a number of questions that I've had about using the advanced panoramic capture techniques that I've laid out in my advanced panorama course. Uh, you know, through both you know, workshop interaction with students and through my email and, and office hour questions, I find that there are people who have a few little stumbling blocks with panoramic capture. So we'll talk about some ways that I've actually simplified my thinking recently about panoramas, just given the new technology that we have. Uh, and I'm also gonna share some new measurements, particularly for you Nikon faithful, for the Z9 with the lenses that I use, as well as some updated lens settings on the Z6, Z7 bodies, which are all the same for the Z6, Z7, Z6 II, Z7 II. Um, before we jump into that, I wanna make sure you all uh, realize you're welcome to join us for free for the office hours that we're holding uh, September 6th, 10 a.m. Pacific. Uh, that's a Tuesday. We're gonna be talking about capturing the Milky Way and star photography, a little bit about moon photography right before a big harvest moon's coming. It's that time of year where it's great to get out photographing the Milky Way. You know, you can get out there early in the evening, not have to stay out till the middle of the night. And we'll talk about some settings and techniques to capture it either just in a single frame with a long exposure or stacked or using the Move, Shoot, Move Star Tracker. So join us for that. You can sign up at hudsonhenry.com slash office hours and give us your questions. It doesn't have to be about night photography, but we'll probably take those night photography questions first. So if you have some burning ones, this is your opportunity to answer those with Rick, Woody, Darren, David, and I. All right, so we're gonna jump in. I'm gonna answer some of your questions right now about panoramas. So I've had a number of people with questions and some misconceptions about panoramas. Uh, and at the same time, I've had some real aha moments with the new technology that we're working with. Higher megapixel sensored cameras, uh, processing software that does a better job dealing with parallax. And so I'm gonna talk about how that's impacted and simplified my panoramic capture thoughts and also dispel some, some, some misconceptions that I think lurk out there, even among some people who've watched my advanced panorama course. And you know that course is always available, just go to hudsonhenry.com, uh, look at courses and you'll find the advanced panorama course. And there's a free download on finding your own no parallax point for your cameras and lenses, whether you shoot Sony or Nikon or Canon or Fuji or any camera lens combination, you can find your own no parallax uh, points and I give a free video. If you go to the to the advanced panorama course, you'll find a free download of a video on how to find the no parallax point. I'm also in this right now just announcing I have gone through and included the Z9's no parallax points for the lenses that I use and updated the lenses I use to include the 24 to 120, the 100 to 400, the 105 macro, the 28 2.8, and I'm even tossing in my, my little Leica Z2 in that because, or Q2, Z2, Q2, I'm in Canon, or in, in Leica uh, Nikon land there for a second. Um, because it's an amazing little camera to have with you all the time. And I know that some of my uh, workshop um, compatriots uh, share that camera too, so I'm putting that one up too. So you can get those really easily. Just There's a link in this video's full description. Just click on the title or show more depending on your platform and you'll see the whole list of links to the gear that I use and my tripods and it'll also have included a link to that new PDF with all of my no parallax points that I've just measured. So enjoy that. Um, now let's get into some misconceptions that I think people have and some questions that they have about even that document. Let's start with no parallax points. You know, I think one thing I hear from people a lot is, you know, I use this adjustable nodal rail from Kirk Enterprise Solutions. I, I worked with Jeff Kirk a little bit on making this a reality because when mirrorless came out, we had 
shorter flange distances from the body to the back element of the lens. And you put a camera with a short wide angle lens on here and all of a sudden you find that the, the nodal rail was in the frame trying to do panoramas. Down at the bottom you got the nodal rail in every shot. That's not what you wanted. So you know the question was do we need to make a short nodal rail and a long nodal rail for different lenses and carry them both in the bag or do we create something that's adjustable? And that's what this LRP3 represents. You can use this mini clamp underneath the main clamp to the camera and slide it forward and backward on the rail. So when I talk about LRP3 at 50, what I mean by that is set your LRP3 at 50, lock it in, and then clamp that into your tripod to do your work. For, for images where parallax is an issue, that's what we're talking about here. Now with my custom tripods, whether I'm using my big fluid head rig or my ultralight four pound setup with the Acrotec panorama head, I generally use the no parallax rail, the LRP3, just because it gets my camera a bit more balanced over the center of the, of the, the head. There's less chance of flop, even if I leave this loose. So I have that there sort of all the time. And then when I want to do a panorama and I'm worried that there might be parallax in the scene, if you're wondering about parallax, see again that, that course I do on advanced panoramas, objects that are close at the same time as you're photographing something with infinity in it where they can appear to move in relation to one another. That's where I set that no parallax point on the LRP slider. It's simple as, it's so easy, you just do it by slotting it into your head, looking at the measurement, whew, you know, you make sure that your LRP3 is set to that setting for the lens that we're talking about. Almost always in all of my lenses, it's generally at 50, but there are a couple of exceptions. So you look at that guide that I've printed or you look at your own guide you've created making your own no parallax points and you set the LRP3 at the correct setting for your lens and then you just clamp it at the setting in the main clamp of your camera forward or aft to get to that point where as you rotate the camera, objects in the foreground don't appear to move in relation to objects in the background. Now, when we look at scenes where there's nothing close to us, you're shooting a big landscape and there's no subject of importance or there's just some water stretching out that's got a little bit of motion to it, you don't really need to worry about parallax. You know, in that sort of case, I generally will just set my camera up, assuming that I'm shooting a horizontal panorama, I'll shoot, set it up vertically so that I'm sweeping a wider sensor through my scene and do a lot of overlap. You know, I talk about overlap in the advanced panorama course, but I don't even need to worry too much about whether I'm exactly on the no parallax point or not unless there's close subjects in the frame. And that's something I've gotten much more cavalier about with the advent of, of Lightroom's merge to panorama and Photoshop's merge to panorama in, engines just getting better and better in every single version. Um, they do a better job dealing with parallax. Now, if I have an extreme circumstance, you know, I, I have, let's say, these leaves of a little tree in the Japanese garden. It's a very famous little maple tree, but it's quite small, and you're sort of inside it, like being under an umbrella as, I, as you photograph a panorama of that tree. Branches are just inches from the front of your ultra-wide angle lens as you're panning through a scene with infinity in it. Well, then I'm going to be really careful about setting that no parallax point because I love that scene, the conditions are beautiful, and I don't want it to have problems merging and setting that no parallax point is gonna be really important. If I'm standing on the edge of a sweeping vista and everything's out of infinity from me, I'm not gonna worry at all. It wouldn't matter whether I had the camera directly over the center of rotation or way, way back over the center of rotation. And I know I get lots of people asking me about rail systems like this really right stuff PG-01. I highlighted the fact that I love this rail system and then it went completely out of stock everywhere. Well, right now, B&H actually has some of these. They went into back order on ones with clamps. There's actually some available right now without clamps. You can put your own clamp on it. And it says it's just two weeks to get these back in stock. So these seem to be shipping. I've heard from a number of people that finally got them after a long wait. But I'm here to tell you, I don't use it very often. You know, when would I use this kind of panoramic rail system? Well, I think that's a frequent misconception for people. You know, when I have a head like I use, whether it's the panorama head from Acrotec or whether it's the, the fluid head from Manfrotto that I use most frequently, um, either way, you level from beneath and the head 
pans level. So you don't need any kind of panning clamp to get level. With a ball head, you have a lot more issues with this kind of thing. With this type of head, it's really easy to just tilt, and because it's leveled from beneath, you're still panning level even though you're tilting. That's not possible with a ball head. You, when you swing with a ball head beneath level, you wind up sort of creating a rainbow or an inverted rainbow, depending on which way you're tilted. If you stay perfectly level and everything's leveled multiple, you can work with, but with these heads, you know, the minute that I get into a position, I'd sort of tilt it, I loosen its leveling adapter. I love this Leo photo one. I look at my bubble level, whoop, there it is, it's level. Now whatever I do, I am panning level. So if I don't have parallax in my scene, which I infrequently have to worry about close subjects when I'm photographing panoramas, I, I just use this head. If I have to tilt a bit, that's just fine. But there are occasions where you have that combination of factors. You're under the tree with the branches really, really close to you. You're on the edge of an escarpment, a top Steens mountain in Eastern Oregon, the highest road in Oregon, and the edge of the rim of the mountain is right in front of you, but you want that sweeping vista with the edge of the mountain in the frame. Or I've been up, snow camped on Mount St. Helens, capturing a scene with the Milky Way or Dawn on the crater rim. And I want the crater rim in the scene. You know, I'm kneeling down in the wind, I'm close to the edge of the volcano, and I want to tilt and capture that. Well, now I'm worried about parallax and I'm tilting. And if you look at this scene right now, even if I'm using a, a head, like the fluid head, or the Acrotech panorama head, and I tilt, what happens? You know, if, if I'm perfectly level and I'm on my mark for my no parallax point, I'm over the center of rotation with that right place inside my lens, in between the elements right where as I rotate, there's no apparent parallax. If I tilt, I'm moving that point forward of the axis of rotation. Now it's out here, not right over the axis of rotation anymore. So that's where we go to vertical rails. That's where the PG-01 comes into play. So I'm gonna take my camera off. I'll show you what I'm talking about. And, and maybe I'll use the little Leica Q2 in this particular. Well, no, I'll show you. I'm actually gonna show you with the Z9. So in this case, I'm gonna pull off my LRP3, and in its stead, I'm gonna go ahead and I'm gonna place the PG01, the really right stuff, ultra light little rail system. I love, I'm not a, a giant fan of a lot of their gear, but this is the nicest, slickest designed ultra light little rail system that I've yet found, and it's perfect for the mirrorless age. So it, it has tilt on, and pan on these two axes. And essentially, it's got a little bubble level right here. And what I'm gonna do is set, you know, it comes in, in pieces. I can keep it in my bag in the two pieces. They weigh almost nothing. I'm gonna go ahead and use my leveling adapter from beneath and get that bubble level in the, in the horizontal rail of this perfectly level lock both adjustments of this head so that nothing's moving aside from that. And then you wanna go ahead and you're gonna lock this in place. Now for my Z6 and Z7, I have these set marks out here near the end where I know it's gonna put the center of the camera body on the LRP3 right over the center of rotation. The Z9 is a little more complicated. I've had people say to me, well, I can't use the PG-01 with the Z9. Well, that's not exactly true. If you drop that in opposite, then you wind up with the clamp facing out, a little odd, but one of the great things about the LRP3 is that it's a double dovetail rail, so you can clamp the forward side of that right into your PG-01. We'll lock that vertical tilt, and then you would clamp your camera right in like that. The adjustment that you want on that rail is gonna be so that the center of your lens is directly over the center of rotation. So you'd carefully ascertain where that's at and make a mark on your rail. Oops, I didn't get that completely locked. So I would re-level the whole thing. Come back here, make sure that your head's still locked. I didn't lock it down tight enough. Simple as getting that guy centered, that bubble level, boop. Now, I can loosen this a smidge and pan, and I can loosen this guy a smidge. It's a little less simple as it was with the Z6 and Z7 with it over here, but it still works just fine. And I can tilt, and what we've got now is the ability to be tilted down at that escarpment and still rotate, 
pan without moving the lens forward. You're still in that no parallax point with your LRP3. So that's what the rails are all about. My use of these is so infrequent these days. I keep them in my bag because it's just a pound, unless I'm in a situation where ultralight is super critical to me. But 99% of the time, even if I'm tilting, I'm not that worried about parallax given how good the modern processing software is at dealing with a little bit of parallax. And I just, as I said, I go ahead and I just tilt my head a little bit and pan through the scene. Sure, it's putting me a little off the no parallax point, but as I said, very, very infrequent that that's a very big problem. Again, you know, you're up on the crater rim of Mount St. Helens, you've worked to get there, it's a once in a lifetime opportunity. I'm gonna break out the rails and make sure it's perfect because I don't wanna get home just to realize, oh man, you gotta go back and do that again. So, that's a couple of misconceptions. Again, I, I think that most people getting started in panoramas don't worry about these rail systems. You know, if you can have a pan and tilt head, like the Acrotec panorama head, or like a fluid head, which I think in general is better for photography as a whole, then absolutely, by all means, you know, just, just tilt the head. You'll learn what types of situations don't work. Practice it everywhere. Practice it with close subjects. Practice it on the edge of, you know, ro rolling off hills where you need to tilt down to photograph your city and maybe there's a rock in the foreground and see whether it works or not. You'll get a feel for when you need to use it. It's just like anything else that we talk about with photography. Practice, practice, practice. That's the whole key to, to, this, to this art of photography is the practice of it with your equipment, with the techniques that you want to do. You're going to have trial and error you know, on your way to becoming proficient at all of this. And I don't think you need to jump out and buy all these tools to get started, particularly now that those you click a button, you say merge to panorama either in... Lightroom, or you click and say edit in and say merge to panorama in Photoshop, amazing. Or if you're a Photoshop user, you just merge to panorama in Photoshop. Second question is when to use each. I would say that if you have any kind of vignetting in your images, if you're using a lens that vignettes, jump into Photoshop to do that. Photoshop has a vignette removal uh, checkbox that does a really nice job. It has more projections possible. It's just a little more nuanced the way that Photoshop works building panoramas. Takes a little time to, to work through it, but it, you know I think Lightroom does a great job, again, 90% of the time, but for those tougher 10%, try it in Photoshop. Um, another thing that's really changed for me with the advent of these incredibly high resolution sensors, you know, here in my Z9, same with the Z7, the Z7 II, the Nikon D850 was kind of the beginning wave of this. You got 46 megapixels. That's a huge amount of resolution. This little Leica Q2, 48 megapixels, a huge amount of resolution. Gone are the days of the Nikon D700 that I used, which was locked in at 12 megapixels. In those days, I would you know, create panoramas with two rows of 12 images just to increase resolution. These days, I can get that same effect with five overlapping frames, six overlapping frames. I mean, it, you've got so much resolution that that's going to work great to create a printable image the size of a billboard that you can walk up to and look close up and it'll look beautiful. Um, you know, so I, I don't find myself creating panoramas with 30 frames as a necessity. The only reason I'm going to do something like that is a multi-row, ultra-wide scene, and I'm still going to use as few frames as I need to. You know, these, these high-resolution sensors are amazing. Now, if you are working with an older camera with a lower-resolution sensor, well, then by all means, throw a narrower uh, or a, a, a smaller focal length or a larger focal length lens on. Instead of shooting it with a 24, shoot it with a 50 and overlap a whole bunch of frames. But, you know, for those of us working with higher megapixel cameras, you just don't need as many frames to get that spectacularly enlargeable and printable image. Um, the, those are the big changes for me when it comes to working with panoramas these days. Are, you know, first of all, the thing that led me to the fluid head was being out on Denali as part of a film crew and working with the fluid head because we all shared one head because of weight limitations and starting to do panoramas with it and realizing, 
my God, I need so much less gear. This thing's perfect for panoramas and then working with long lenses and thinking, wow, this works like a gimbal with long lenses and then realizing, my God, when I'm setting up a landscape scene, all I have to do is shift a little bit, tilt a little bit, it's, it stays level and I can make micro adjustments without loosening the ball and having everything go floppy. Um, and, and so it was panoramas that led me to these pan and tilt heads instead of ball heads. Um, it simplifies everything. Then secondly, the higher resolution sensors just making it so you don't need to capture as many frames to get high quality imagery. And finally, the increased performance of the panoramic merger engines in our photo editing software just makes it so that you don't need to worry as much about parallax as you once did. It does a wonderful job just sort of warping things enough to make everything merge well. Now, that doesn't mean that in some extreme cases, you might wanna to go to the trouble of using a rail, and that if you're like me, and you shoot with a, a, a uh, what you call a nodal slider, but a no parallax slider is more accurate, watch my video course, you'll see why, you know, just locking that in there and sliding forward and back gets you a little bit more balanced so that you don't have to worry as much about flop. You know, the fluid's saving me here, but I'm also balanced. I do that pretty much all the time just to, for ease of use when photographing. But as long as I'm in that situation, moving to the no parallax point is as easy as that when I want to go and create a panorama. So boom, now I'm set and I don't have to worry about whether there's parallax or not. Okay, so remember, I've got updated settings for all the new lenses that I'm using, for the Z9 body, for the Leica Q2, for anybody who has that, uh, just sh click on show more or the title of this video, depending on your platform, see the full description that I've written and you'll find links in there. Um, to my custom tripod builds, to how to build your own custom tripod, to these no parallax po measurement points that I've done, to the free video on creating your own no parallax points, you got questions about panoramas, hit me up in the comments, uh, email me, send in a question for office hours. Remember office hours, September 6th, 10 a.m. Pacific. We're gonna talk about night photography. Sending your questions, sign up at, Hudson, at hudsonhenry.com slash office hours. And links to all my gear, I keep updated all the time at hudsonhenry.com slash ATS links. I keep those updated and those links help me out. So thanks so much for using them. Um, and hey, I hope everyone's staying safe, staying creative. I've got some fun stuff coming, including my review of this new sort of, you know, once again, Nikon just slaying it with the lenses. This little ultra lightweight, weighs nothing, 400, 4.5, that is really sharp and uses the same custom Kirk foot as the 70 to 200 and 100 to 400, which is nice. Um, pretty amazing little lens. I'll compare it to the 100 to 400. And also with teleconverters, compare it to the 800 PF. So look out for that. That's coming really soon. All right, everybody. Stay safe. Stay creative. We'll see you next week.